so good afternoon. Good afternoon to Lisbon. I would like to confirm from the side of Luzia de Lisbon with Professor Margarida de Oliveira uh, Martins if uh, we can proceed also with the next section. Yes, please. Thank you. So it's always obviously a pleasure to see and to be in my own country, which is not very common in my UN career, and especially in the city that I was born. So a special thanks to Professor Marisa for facilitating my, my presence in here, and also to Professor Manuel Augusto. It's a pleasure to see you again. Um, I think this session will obviously will be, will be an interesting one. I hope after lunch is not too challenging to the students that are with us. If, if you snore, please snore uh, not too loud, so we don't perturb, disturb the speakers, neither though the, the other colleagues that might be snoring next to you. Uh, if you don't snore, I have agreed with Professor Marisa that you'll have at least two more points in your gradings. So I do think you have an extra motivation to stay with us and also for sure an interesting discussion over, over the sustainable or sustainability standards, which is the panel seven. Uh, I would like to start, obviously, to appreciate the speakers, and I will introduce my uh, first speaker in a few minutes. But also, let me start by using a quote. And in modern world, I think Charles Darwin could be also with such changes in our world could be a good example to, to kickstart our discussions. And Charles Darwin said the following, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one who most responsible and responsive to change. So this capacity to adapt to the mutation of our world is also something that is very linked with the topic of this section, which is how we sustain and sustainability. And in that sense, without further ado, I will introduce the first speaker. And this first speaker is Professor Rushashi Ray, is Associate Professor of Mainwood University School of Business, Ireland, and Professor at Chim University, India. At Maynooth University, Ireland is responsible for design and delivery of business related modules. Professor uh, Ray, and in my opinion, this is a symbol of multilateralism and multiculturality, has taught students from 35 plus nationalities in 23 countries. So actually, this gives you the responsibility to adapt your communication model to the different students in Portugal. And he has also been an invited speaker in different universities. And obviously, I think Harvard, Cornell, Yale, University of Queensland, also Ching Yu University in China. And this gives you also the stamp of the validation of the higher education institutions and how your teaching and reflections are useful also in the sense of building the future generation of students. You have, you have won several grants and scholarships from different universities, different think tanks, I would say, which gives you also the external validation of your efforts and teaching, your passion for teaching. And of course, uh, the number of um, your subject research areas inter is the intersection between business, society, marketing, and obviously sustainable development. Uh, I think the level of research and the published articles that you have, have done speaks by itself. So thank you for joining us and also looking forward to hear from you. So you have the floor, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. First of all, thanks Dr. Marco for your kind words and I'm greatly honored to be at this beautiful campus of Luciada University. My first visit to Portugal, but uh, I always had a lot of interest in your country, uh, not least because one of the early Portuguese explorers discovered my country, he believed so. Uh, so, but it happened by error but my visit is not an error, it's an intent and I'm looking forward to a discussion. This is the worst slot you can have as a speaker. Uh, and the problem with the professor after the lunch hour is I cannot sleep as I speak. But as Dr. Marco said, you know, follow some norms and you can. So I'm going to talk about something that we have been doing for the last 15 years, something very practical. Uh, any guess? Uh, can you see the slides? No. So, yeah. 
Any guess what is the message in this slide is from my dear students in the room? That's a smart answer. <laughs> you will get a pass mark, but not an A+. You have to go beyond that. What's the message I'm trying to say in this slide? The first row is corruption, but what is this guy at the bottom sort of telling you? He has money, he has power, anybody else? Oh, okay, that's from the top. But what's this guy doing at the bottom? Hmm, sorry? Beautiful. So what I want to bring into the focus is the fact every corrupt activity starts with a decision. And the assumption that all of us in this room have faced this conflict in our life, what decision we will take. So this led us to a project of what we call as the giving voice to values. Uh, essentially in one simple line, it is, there is a full book on that and I'm show, going to show you the picture, but it just says, if you have to speak up for your values, how to do that? without losing your job. The last part is important. We don't want to be a martyr. We don't want to be the villain or the hero. We want to keep our job, but we want to sort of speak up. And I'm sure I'm not going to do a full workshop, but I do that all around the world. I'll talk about that. It's done with my colleague in University of Virginia Darden School of Business, Professor Mary Gentili. Whatever I'm going to tell you is based on real life, around 600 case studies of people from all around the world, right from frontline executives to students to CEOs who told us how they voice their values. So I pick up from where Jay, Professor Jay talked about before the lunch. How do we help people to speak up? So going back a little beyond the project, before the project started, it actually started in the Columbia University campus and in Yale, uh, when the incoming batch of MBA students were asked, given an ethical dilemma, and they were asked, what will you do if you face this? And the finding was very interesting. Around 30% said, of course, we'll do whatever it takes to keep our job. 30% of the people said, if, if it's too much, I will quit. But around 30%, I'm sort of simplifying the numbers here, said, we will try to speak out. And that gave us the trigger. Is it really true that people are successful in speaking out about their ethical values when facing a dilemma? So we looked at research starting from Nazi, Holocaust, concentration camps, sports, cognitive neuroscience, you know, what is it that helps people to speak out? And you have the book and the site and the MOOC. And if you're not happy with all of them, I am there to help you. But uh, this is not a theoretical model. We have done this in more than 1,000 plus organizations. Uh, US military, for example. And you can imagine the military would be having a lot of conflicts in a day-to-day -day life. Unilever, Glaxo. Lockheed Martin, the defense contractor, but also the CFA Institute, the Finance and Accounting Institute. So all sorts of people around the world are trying this out and I'm happy to talk a little bit about what this is. So the focus of GVV is not Aristotle. It's not a theory, it's not a model, but it starts with a basic assumption. What if you want to speak out how should you speak? How should you act? And then help you to practice that. And feel free to ask me as many questions as possible, but the focus is on action. So there are seven things in a GVV world. The first assumption is of course that I want to speak out. 
if anybody thinks we'll keep silent, you know, GVV is not for them, but we assume we all go to our workplace wanting to live a good life, wanting to speak out, but often we are silenced because of fear or other things. So the first is values, the first pillar. I'll talk about each of them in maybe around one or two minutes. Happy to take questions at the end. And let me go through each of these pillars and then I'll sort of sum it up at the end. So when we say values, the first hand that goes up in the class is, yeah, but values is so culture specific. You know, if I am a Muslim, I have a certain type of value. If I'm a Buddhist, I have a certain type of value. So we have addressed this question by looking at what we call as hyper norms. Irrespective of religion, culture, country, there are around four or five values that you find in every book, every context of the world. And we are saying, let's appeal to those values when we face a conflict, because it's shared by everybody both by you if you are facing a conflict, but somebody who is inflicting that conflict on you. So respect, for example, everybody in the world understands respect as a value. So if you face a crisis, the first trigger is to look for those values which are common. Whether you are in a corporate, whether you are in a college, whether you are in the United Nations, respect is a common value. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. The second and the important thing is often when we talk to students in the beginning, a lot of people said, I am too small in the organization to speak up. And when we talk to the CEOs, they said, I am too big to speak up. Because if I say something, maybe 100 people will lose their jobs. But we realized the people who speak up believe they have a choice. They believe that they can speak up. And that's an important part, that you have a choice. So in doing this, we often ask the class to think of two situations in their life. And I would like you to think about that and feel free to share if you want for a couple of minutes. The one instance in your life when you spoke up, you know, and there would be another instance in your life when you chose not to. So the exercise is to think what helped you to speak up in the first place, but what disabled you not to speak up in the second place. I'll tell you an example from my own life. So in my earlier avatar, I was working as an executive in a big multinational company, and I had two bosses, you know, like this dotted line reporting. So I was reporting to two people. They were not in good relationship. One of them once showed me a picture, a funny picture in a magazine and told me, why don't you go to the other boss and show him this picture and tell him that he looks like this funny guy. And I didn't like that approach, but I, I couldn't say anything because I thought I was too small. But when I look back at that incident, I realized that if I would have spoken up, possibly I would have maintained my self-esteem much more. The reason I did not was I was new to the organization and I was very scared. So I can guarantee in this room, all of you had or have two such instances. One instance when you actually spoke up and the other instance when you could not. And we do this over an half an hour exercise for you to think and share with the class, what were the enablers, what were the disablers? I remember one example from my experience of teaching in Russia. You know, Russia, the moment you mention the word today has a lot of connotations and negative imageries, but like all human beings, you know, Russian human beings are also great. Uh, I had lovely students there. I remember one story that sort of sticks to me out of so many workshops I've given around the world on giving voice to values. So she said that in Russia, you know, the ballet theater is very popular. And a lot of girls spend a lot of time in learning ballet. Uh, she didn't want to do ballet, but her parents really wanted her to go to this very special club 
and take a lot of rigorous training. And although I told the students, you don't have to disclose, she said, I want to say, because I want to share this. Uh, one day I decided I don't want to do this ballet. This is not who I am. And I, we asked her like, what made you speak up against your parents? She said that actually, I discussed this issue with a friend of mine. And she said that, do you want to be somebody else for the rest of your life or do you want to be yourself? And that conversation helped me. But she also told us about another incident when she could not speak up. So the idea here is all of us have given voice to our values at some point of time or other. Let us try to discover that moment to get strength. The third pillar or the third part of giving voice to values is normalization. What does it say? Any guess from the slide? What is the message here? When we say ethical conflict in the workplace and I use the term normalization, what am I trying to say in this slide through these two pictures? Would you like to try again? Go ahead. You are my ally and friend. Yeah, what we found out when we are talking to these 500, 600 people around the world, interviewing them, is that generally when we talk about the ethical conflict, sometimes we get shocked, oh my God, how can my boss ask me to change the date of a bill? How can I see my colleagues stealing something from the office, as Jay was telling? How can we change our sales figures? How can we bribe? People seem to be shocked. But the reality is these conflicts happen every day in every organization. So the picture on the top basically says, there is no point in being angry and emotional about it. The more emotional we are, the more mistakes we will make. So let us be like the laughing Buddha. You know, try to think when I walk into the office, there will be an ethical conflict today. It's normal in the college, in the club, in a meeting. So when you think it's normal, your reaction also becomes sort of spontaneous and normal. You don't get shocked. You don't become the hero or the villain of the meeting. But you just take it as a normal challenge and try to handle that. So expect values conflicts so that you can approach them calmly and competently. If you overreact, if you are emotional, it's good in a drama, it's good in a movie, good in a Netflix series, but in real life, it doesn't work being you know, over emotional. The fourth pillar is purpose. And this is what we found when we talked to people around the world. They had a very clear idea, what is their purpose in life? And our experience is, if you have clarity on your purpose, you can sort of go back to that and shape your response. So in this room, I do not know, maybe some of you have a purpose to be a lawyer, to create a just society. Some of you may have a purpose to become a manager to create livelihoods, but the clearer you are about your purpose, easier it is for you to see that I can't become a lawyer or an engineer or a professor if I do this action. It helps you to anchor yourself, but it's also important to understand what's the purpose of the person who is trying to ask you to violate some code of conducts. Imagine a discussion between a senior lawyer and an intern, a senior officer and an intern. Ultimately, they have common purposes, but very often we sort of split it. But every organization, for example, would like to sustain themselves, would like to succeed, would not like to see complaints. So two angles of this purpose, one is what is my purpose? And can I hold on to that when I'm responding? 
but also what is the other person's purpose? Is there some common ground based on which I can build my argument? And in general, in a workshop, we ask you to write it down because when you write it down, it's very different when it's in your head. But when you start writing it down, you realize, okay, if I want to be so-and-so person, possibly this action is not aligned to that. Okay, similar question. This pillar we call it is self-knowledge, self-image, alignment. That's the clue. And the question are the two pictures on the top. How do you link the top and the bottom? So to rephrase the question, if we have to give voice to our values, we need to have self-knowledge, self-image, and alignment, how is it linked to the pictures to the, on the top? Maybe I'll give the chance to somebody else and then definitely will be the last and the best one. Go ahead. Anybody wants to try this? Can't be that difficult a question for brilliant students like this. More students want to come in and answer, but we are not letting them in. Go ahead. Nobody else wants to try? Come on, guys. How will self-image and self-knowledge help you to respond to a values crisis, a ethical conflict? Yes. So what do you mean when you say, if I don't know myself, what do you mean by that? I don't know myself, I, my personality, I mean. And can you elaborate, like, what do you mean when you say, if I don't know my personality? Uh, let me say, if I'm a pleasant person or I'm a nice person. Wonderful, me. wonderful. Yeah, now I, I should come back to you, my friend. You want to add something there? Which is typically the person who is looked up to, and then I see everybody else. Yeah, so how do you translate that? Well, uh, if you're a Superman, you know what your values are because you bring them out, and other people see that in you. But if you are everybody else and you're not sure what your values are, they end up disappearing because there are no values. In you. Okay, I think in this case, I have to give the you know, imaginary award to her, but uh, it, it's good fight. So basically what we are saying is, I'll give my example and then I'll ask you to think about that. So when I face a conflicting situation, I start getting angry very first. And that impacts my response. So if I know that, and if I'm in a conflicting situation, I always try not to respond immediately. Going back to what you said, what's your name? Jessica. As Jessica said, just to sort of elaborate, if I know I'm an introvert or I'm an extrovert, I can craft my response accordingly. If I know, for example, that I am a solo player, like a lot of us, we, want, we are not very comfortable in groups, but very good in one-to-one -one interactions. But some of us in this room are very comfortable in groups. We do good teamwork and group assignments. So those who are good in groups would often like to find an ally when they face a conflict and use that ally to go to the boss or another colleague or somebody else. 
But those who are solo players would often ask for an appointment themselves and say that, can we talk it out? But those who are very emotional, they often told us that we never respond verbally. We prefer to type an email, sometimes show it to a friend or parents or whoever, and then send our mails. So this is a very important part that your response is shaped by who you are. Do not try to change that. Then possibly the results are not very good. And this is the interesting part of the GVV is we don't just do this for a half an hour session and then take a flight and go back. Why GVV is a very different exercise from everything else you will hear in ethics sessions is it believes in two things. How many of you here go to the gym? Can you raise your hands, please? I don't, so I don't have to, yeah. And those of you are regular gym goers, you would realize that it's not about going tomorrow or not. It's about sustaining that going at a regular pace because that's how you build your muscles. We bring that to this ethics discussion and talk about moral muscles. So if I can, if we can practice continuously about situations where there will be an ethics conflict, chances are a real life conflict when it happens, we will be able to speak out. So a big part of GVV workshop is scripting. And the second part is peer coaching. So it's like in this class, we'll divide you into small groups. Think of a real life conflict situation. Whom will you address? What will you say based on the seven pillars? But the rest of the class gives the feedback to you. I don't teach. So it's, this is what we call as peer coaching. The most powerful form of learning is peer to peer. And that's how we develop this ability to speak out. My, Dr. Marco has shown me some warnings. So you know, I'll now quickly wrap up. But last, I think, couple of points. And one is about reason and rationalization. So whenever you are thinking about a conflict, it's about cheating in the exam. It's about not doing the group work. It's about bribing somebody. You can expect certain reasons already given. If we know that, we can practice about that. So what could be some of those reasons? Truth versus loyalty. Sometimes you will be asked to choose. It's right versus right, not right versus wrong. Right versus wrong is fairly easy to choose and respond to. Sometimes it's individual versus community. Sometimes it's short term versus long term. We can argue for both. Justice versus mercy. Just, just this time you do this. Then again from tomorrow we'll be the most honest company in the world. I'll be the best boss you would ever have. So when you expect this, you can also practice your responses. When you practice this response, it becomes like going to the gym. In real life when this comes, you are more confident to respond. Okay, I think, you know, I'll, I'll wrap up, but happy to take questions. These are the seven pillars I talked to you about in the last 15 minutes. I think 15, but maybe it's 30, I don't know. Values, choice, normalization, purpose, self-knowledge, voice, reasons, and rationalization. So I want to end with poetry because I like poetry myself. I'm a failed poet. Uh, you know, just tried writing to impress some girls when I was in class eight, but you know, still sort of can't come out of that. So want to start with the famous Portuguese poet uh, talking about, I bear the wounds of all the battles I have avoided. And every ethical conflict that you don't respond actually hurts you. So the more you avoid, the more wounded you will be. But GVV actually allows you to go to what our Indian Nobel laureate poet Tagore said, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high. So I think we need to make this transition. Obrigado. Thank you very much, Professor Ray. 
I think you fulfill our expectations on your communication skills. So thank you for guiding us through the corruption that implicates always a decision, a decision to speak out based on the triple A's that you mentioned, awareness, analysis, actions, and giving voices to values. And for sure, this will create enabling environments to, to all of us make the correct decisions and to empower ethic and anti-corruption behavior. So with this right or versus wrong or right versus wrong, for sure we will choose the right path. So thank you for these inspiring words. I will move on. And of course, any questions we'll take on, on the end of the next intervention. I would like to introduce the next speaker, Professor Dimitrar Dimitrov, which is an economist by training. He's, join us, he's joining us online. Currently is the rector of the University of National and World Economy from Sofia, Bulgaria. He has more than 100 publications. Uh, 26 of them in English, 78 in Bulgarian. He's author or co-author co of six, 16 monographs, four textbooks. He obviously has published also in different countries, Netherlands, Germany, US, UK, and of course received also several uh, research awards abroad. Obviously he's working on the interlinkages between economic analysis in defense and security, international operations, security policy, nuclear safety and security, and he's also obviously working in different aspects that interlink all these elements. So I'm very impressed, Marisa, how you can put all of these brilliant speakers and well-known persons in an event of two days. Also, congratulations to you. But more important, let's try to hear online to Professor Dimitrov. Thank you for joining us. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to join this Congress. And thank you very much for the kind invitation from the rector of the university. Uh, it's a very interesting topic, and uh, for me, it's a pleasure to share my experience with uh, anti-corruption education. Uh, I like very much this uh, metaphor with uh, going to gym from the previous speaker, and education is something like this, you know better that way. Uh, first of all, thank you for the kind uh, introduction of me and uh, a little bit of my university. Uh, we are one of the biggest universities in Bulgaria, typical business university, uh, mostly specialized in the field of economics, but we have also law where uh, problems of corruption also are uh, included, uh, journalism, uh, sociology, administration and management, but typically we are a business university with 15,000 students, uh, many doctoral students and international projects and other things. Uh, based in Sofia. <clears throat> uh, uh, in principle, I am uh, specialized in the field of uh, security and defense economics. And uh, corruption uh, uh, provoke many problems with uh, security. Uh, and also corruption is also very expensive for the, the separate entities for the whole society. And that's why my interest, not only my interest, but the interest of my colleagues from Department National and Regional Security in our university uh, is provoked by this uh, interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, I can uh, um, show many interesting examples from the world uh, when a very small amount of bribery could uh, 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 provoke a very big event, uh, even uh, terrorist act in the airplane or uh, very big uh, problems with uh, computer security or other things. Uh, sometimes people underestimate uh, uh, these uh, problems. It depends on the culture and the attitude uh, to these problems. And they are not, uh, they, they don't uh, have uh, zero toler tolerance to, to, to this uh, phenomenon of corruption. Uh, some of them think, oh, maybe this is small, maybe this is appropriate, maybe it's okay for our culture and other things, but the real uh, full uh, uh, cost of uh, this uh, uh, phenomena, corruption, uh, for the society is very big. And uh, sometimes uh, people don't realize how big uh, are the consequences of such kind of uh, activities. Uh, so my interest to this uh, started more actively in 2016 when I visited uh, um, a round table in Albania, close to Bulgaria. Uh, it was organized by, by uh, UNODC, uh, Vienna. 
Uh, and I was the only economist at this uh, meeting. It was strange, but uh, the other one was a uh, uh, professor in political st studies and all other people were uh, professors in law, <clears throat> which provokes uh, uh, many interesting questions. Why only people from judicial law faculties are uh, dealing with these uh, problems? And uh, my view, my point of view was that uh, this is very important, not only for the paragraphs and laws related to anti-corruption and definitions uh, and other things, but it also related with uh, uh, many business ethics, uh, many attitudes toward this uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, and it's better for the students, not only for the law students, uh, to know what kind of uh, laws they have to follow and how they uh, uh, have to implement them, but also to, uh, for the every, every other students, even from technical universities, to know what uh, is corruption and what is the real price of corruption for the enterprise, for the company, for the university, for the, <clears throat> for the whole society. And that's why we started to develop this idea because here we are talking about sustainability. Uh, we started to develop this idea of uh, anti-corruption education, uh, uh, no, but not only for the law students uh, in our university or related university universities. And we started with uh, agreement with uh, uh, UNO DC in Vienna, uh, together with our government and our uh, deputy prime minister signed agreement with UNO DC uh, with some uh, um, paragraphs in this that uh, the both organizations and our government will support anti-corruption uh, education. Uh, for all universities in Bulgaria and will stimulate uh, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, type of providing knowledge to all students in Bulgaria. And uh, in the next years, uh, 17, 18, we uh, provided, uh, we organized two uh, so-called anti-corruption academies because uh, from a managerial point of education or managerial point, it is not so easy to uh, include uh, discipline uh, in the curriculum of uh, for the econ economists uh, to include such kind of discipline uh, many people consider that it's not just uh, it's not all suitable for the economists it maybe it's low and other things but we decided to avoid this and to open this discussion and uh, providing this knowledge to all students in our university so uh, we organized this so-called anti-corruption academy and we received uh, support from the Council of Ministers, uh, several NGO, uh, NGOs which are dealing with uh, anti-corruption, also uh, Ministry of Interior, um, World Bank, represents World Bank, European Commission in Bulgaria. Uh, it was a series of public lectures with some practical examples uh, how uh, they are dealing and uh, fighting with uh, corruption and uh, examples and we have uh, representatives of uh, some German foundations which are supporting some uh, projects related to anti-corruption education. It was very interesting for all uh, kinds of students. Uh, and then we, after uh, finishing of these public lectures, we provided certificates for the participants in these uh, um, anti-corruption lectures. Uh, some of these uh, institutions, they have their own anti-corruption uh, units, and it was very interesting the, the different uh, um, point of view of these anti-corruption units. One of them is Ministry of Interior, one of them is in the Ministry of Finance, one of them is from uh, educational organizations, uh, because corruption could be everywhere. And uh, the students uh, were able to understand uh, uh, the general legislative framework uh, of anti-corruption, but also to learn uh, not only um, uh, legislation, but also culture, attitude, uh, good practices, uh, good practices in other countries, uh, which step by step us uh, going to gym uh, every day or <laughs> two, two times per week. Uh, uh, provides very stable um, knowledge and attitude toward this uh, this phenomenon. 
uh, <coughs> and uh, when uh, we are ready with this, uh, with the help of uh, one of the one of the uh, anti-corruption bodies in our country, it is with a very long uh, name. Uh, uh, but the main goal is anti-corruption and uh, corruption in the uh, high level of politicians and uh, uh, people from the high levels of the state. Uh, with help of them uh, with, uh, and their active assistance, we created master program <laughs> called anti-corruption in our university. Uh, because again, uh, there is no... Uh, this is not enough only to know juridical problems, definitions, uh, concrete laws and other things, but also you have to establish a good uh, administration, a good organization and to uh, provide and to know how to provide or to follow uh, procedures, uh, openness, uh, transparency, uh, communication with the society, uh, where are the weak uh, places in the laws which allows legal corruption, uh, because there are some sometimes uh, moral points and other things. And <clears throat> this uh, master program in economics, uh, anti-corruption, uh, was very successful for several years. Uh, so we were able to, with the help of our students uh, and the participation of uh, uh, people who already work in this anti corruption uh, uh, units in these organizations, we were all able to uh, provide several master courses for these years. And uh, after that, uh, we were able to publish some books in order to uh, uh, organize uh, the. Um, uh, carrying out the, the master program. And then uh, <clears throat> we uh, were able to, uh, to, to participate in some small project with UNODC. One of them was uh, with, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, also called Dimitrov, uh, about the ethics and attitude of the students toward this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, phenomenon, corruption. It was a very interesting project because uh, very small with only several lectures with the students, but uh, the value of this was that uh, the students could, uh, 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 you, you can compare the different results of the students because it was uh, provided in several countries. Uh, and to educate the students, uh, what is uh, the attitude to this uh, phenomena uh, what they have to expect, that there are different uh, kinds of documents, code of conducts, and different international agreements and other things. So step by step, we are uh, uh, increasing the level of knowledge and uh, uh, attitude of our students to, to this uh, very uh, complex uh, phenomena corruption. And, and there is a place for many other projects and for many other publications and for many other scientific discussions uh, about uh, definitions and what is corruption, what is other type of crime and other things, they still continue. And also uh, these problems uh, of uh, fighting corruption are included in many other conferences in our uh, university. So we are uh, uh, step by step, we're uh, uh, broadening our um, research uh, efforts and our attitude toward this uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, so with this uh, introduction from the, how to say, educational managerial approach to the fighting of corruption, I would like to thank you for the attention and uh, to uh, listen to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, P Professor Dimitrov. Also, thank you for guiding us through that actually small corruption has a big impact systemic in different parts of the security and defense apparatus. So the level of corruption doesn't interfere with the impact that that creates in those two sectors. Even small actions can have a disruptive effect on those two sectors. And also 
to highlight the tolerance to corruption as one of the key factors to that undermine ethical behavior. Also, I want to mention that obviously anti-corruption education is part of UNODC efforts to work with the different member states and with your university also, and particularly to enable the students and higher education institutions to have a role to play and play that role on creating critical thinking on the new series of citizens. With that said, uh, and I'm very pleased that my request for your attention and the students in here in Oporto was exceptional. Professor Marisa is taking notes of who actually attended this section to benefit in your school gradings. But no, now in a more serious note, I want to ask if any questions to our speakers. Actually, they have some thought provoking messaging and I want to open the floor for any questions. Thank you. You are the savior of the day and you're a savior also of my moderation since I could not keep the time, at least we have a question. So thank you for that. Okay. Uh, so the question I don't think is really about corruption. It's more about values. You spoke about values and you spoke about Darwin. So I've conjured those two things. So um, we as a culture, as a species, we as a has of an integral value in us to make us reprocreate, right? To move forward, to have more babies. And I was speaking to a friend of mine yesterday and she said that she thinks it would be ego egoistic of her to have children because she feels like she's contributing to overpopulation so i wanted to ask where do you think this kind of thinking stands from why this decrease in the value of reproduction of our species is now so prevalent in today's thinking because i know she's not the only one feeling that way Thank you. I'm not sure if I understood your question, or uh, but I want to clarify that giving voice to values works when you decide to speak up. There are a lot of people who decide not to at a certain cost. So this, the people we interviewed are the people who decided to speak up, maybe at home, maybe at office, maybe in the college. And we were trying to understand, is there something common across all these people? So there are certain assumptions behind that. And one assumption is that you want to speak up. And when you want to speak up, then what we are saying is if you can anticipate the counter arguments and you can, it's like, you know, before a drama, you practice in front of the mirror or even a debate in the college to gain confidence, right? Somebody must have told you that. So it's very similar. So if in this room, uh, we know that there are a couple of issues which we all, of, we all of us face, and suppose we create a sort of small drama with responses, whom should we address this dialogue to? What should we say? Is it aligned to who I am? Is it aligned to my purpose and the other person's purpose? All we are saying is you have a higher chance of succeeding if you do that. If you practice beforehand, and then in the real life, you have a higher chance. Not that this is a surefire way. I don't know whether I answered your question, but I took that opportunity to clarify that this is not a one silver bullet to solve all ethical conflicts in the world. And also there is no ethical theories here. Our assumption is you know what is right, but you want to speak up on that. So we are not even questioning, how do you know that is right? Okay. I just thought about values more, I guess. I didn't think about yeah, so here our, our assumption is you know those values and, but you want to speak up. And for some reasons you are not able to, then how do we empower you okay. based on successful examples? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much the experience is so much different. We, we have to think about these problems transnationally. Uh, Joseph was saying this, this is not a local problem, it's an international problem, but the context is everything. From your experience from lecture in India or in Dublin now, what are the main differences culturally that you see as barriers to make us have a common voice to address these transnational problems? 
Thank you. Yeah, so, you know, actually the answer is, uh, we have found more similarities in people who have spoken up. For example, I have, the, in GVV, if you go to the site, you will find cases, very different types of cases. For example, one administrator, you know, a local regional bureaucrat trying to balance two religions, extremely sensitive and delicate topic. But the way he does is this is very similar to another executive I interviewed who was heading the operations in an African country for a pharma company. And uh, these are all true stories. So, you know, the health, the health minister said that they will approve that particular drug in that particular country if his daughter is recruited in this guy's organization. So very different cultures, India and this African country, one multinational, other government. But if you look at the underlying way they responded, it is same. You know, they looked at how can I speak up? Uh, but before they asked, what is my purpose? So in the first case, the bureaucrat knew the broad purpose is to maintain peace in the region and help in the progress. And that's non-negotiable. So he sort of called on that purpose. And when, when he was speaking to the community leaders, the leaders also have the same purpose. If the region doesn't have peace, they lose their next vote. And in the case of the multinational organization, the purpose was to build a brand in that country, in Africa. And if it is known that he has recruited the health minister's daughter, obviously the brand will not have a good life in the long run. So go back to the purpose, but also see if you have some allies and appeal to the purpose of the others, do it in a way which is aligned to your own self personality. I think this is common. Thank you, thank you so much. I also have a question to Professor Dimitrov. I'm not sure if he's still with us online. If not, that's okay. Yes, I'm here. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Dimitrov. I, 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 I have this opportunity that I won't miss it. So as a professor, a researcher, but also the rector of this huge university in Sofia, and we have so much students here. With us, I would love to ask you, uh, well, University of National World Economy, it's, it's leader in, in addressing those enrichment of curricula, um, considering all of these topics. What were your main um, difficulties to, to alter and have this, uh, well, forward approach to the curricula? Because we're professors here and we have our students here, we have to lecture topics that are mandatory but we need to give them some multilateral, multidisciplinary approachments, and it's not easy. The, the, this Congress is just, just an example of what we can, can do, but to integrate the topics in the curricula, it's, it's quite challenging and puzzling. What were your main difficulties to start addressing this and give this more broad and open uh, concept to your curricula? Thank you so much, Dimitrov. Uh, thank you for your uh, question. Uh, really, it's uh, the, the, the top, uh, uh, part of the including such kind of knowledge in the curriculum uh, and the problem is uh, with the thinking of the people because uh, uh, many people consider that uh, we have economic theory and economic problems which have to be included there and uh, this is a problem for the law faculty and uh, this is a problem for the legislation and these things are separated uh, but step by step i think that uh, uh, it could be done, and that's why we uh, choose that uh, uh, this approach uh, to include all of the students uh, in this uh, public lectures and uh, uh, anti-corruption academies. And I think that uh, step by step, uh, the colleagues understand why we are doing this and why uh, it is important, and they understand this. Uh, in many specialities and many scientific directions, there is a such kind of problem that people think that uh, they have to go in one, only one uh, direction. But uh, now I think that the situation is, is better. There are many interdisciplinary master programs, especially in our university, and uh, collaboration with different departments from different faculties, because it's not only economic problem, not legislation, it's a cultural 
problems of uh, media and uh, uh, sociology and cultural problems. So we're going in that direction, but not uh, immediately. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if uh, in from Lisbon any questions or from here will you check and see. Professor Margarida, any any student or teacher with any questions in Lisbon? No, uh, but I would have a, a small question to Professor Subasis on 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 the on the issue of uh, the giving voice to values. Uh, do we have by any chance any difference of gender in this speaking out before a decision is taken? Do, 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 do you consider the difference between men and women in this uh, uh, address of uh, these issues? Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your question and congratulations for pronouncing my name rightly. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a challenge. I most I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I... You did, did, you did, oh, you did a great job. It's a challenge that most people avoid, you know. Uh, they, they want to be in a cultural safe space by going to my surname, Ray. But uh, you are a brave woman, congratulations for that. Uh, yeah, we didn't do that actually, you know, we didn't uh, look at whether uh, women were um, better or different. But what we realized is, or what GVV is telling is that if as a woman, you have a different way of responding, take advantage of that. You know, if you are more comfortable by nonverbal communication or in a certain cultural context, if that helps you, they do take the advantage of that. But we, I know in this series of cases, we have frontline executives who are women and also a women CEO. So, but we really didn't try to segregate those two, because our focus is more on the commonality and not the differences. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not brave enough to say your first name, but I'm brave enough to, to thank you and Professor Dimitrov for the, the brilliant presentation is also the colleagues that facilitated also the interactions with you and your presentation. So um, I, th I will conclude this panel, appreciating also both. And I will, if uh, Professor Marisa is in agreement and Professor Margarida will move to the next and final panel, the eighth panel uh, for this section. So thank you very much. Thank you.